Today we are going to study a very important subject. And the subject is entitled That Other Angel. Our key text to commence this study is taken from Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Jesus mentioned here that one of the last signs that would take place before his coming would be the preaching of the gospel to all the world. And the disciples, after they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they went out to preach the gospel with great power. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 18, we read, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. In the time of the apostles, the message of the gospel went to every part of the world. And the Apostle Paul further says here in Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. Colossians 1 23. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. The Apostle Paul here confirms that the gospel was preached or had been preached, and every creature which is under heaven heard the gospel. Did the end come? No, the end did not come. Was the word of Jesus at fault? Because he said that when the gospel will be preached everywhere in the world, the end will come. The end did not come for one specific reason. Because a great part, the very important part of the everlasting gospel was still to be proclaimed. And this part of the everlasting gospel we find in Revelation chapter 14. And let us read from verse 6. Revelation 14 verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The Apostle John here in the book of Revelation says that an angel had the everlasting gospel in his hand and this angel had to, be, had to proclaim the everlasting gospel to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This message of this angel, which is the first message, or as known the first angel's message, 
proclaims the coming judgment. The hour of his judgment is come. And for that reason, this angel calls the attention of all people to fear God and give glory to him. Also, to worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. We notice that this angel is proclaiming his message with a loud voice. And we should take very careful notice of this expression, loud voice. But this everlasting gospel is not only the first angel's message. We read in verse 8, And there followed an other angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The second angel proclaims his message saying, but not in a loud voice, just saying, Babylon is fallen. And then in verse 9 to 12 we read, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In verse 9, a third angel is introduced. And this third angel should proclaim his message also with a loud voice. The first and the third angel's message ought to be proclaimed with a loud voice. The second angel's message was proclaimed without a loud voice. We do not want to comment much about these three angels because the three angels and their messages are well known in Adventist circles. But just mentioning that the first angel proclaimed the coming hour of judgment which represented the work of William Miller and his co-workers and this message officially began to be proclaimed in 1833 the second angel was proclaimed for the first time in the summer of 1844. And at that time, it was announced the fall of the churches who refused to accept the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus. And the third angel began his work in 1844 
after October 22nd. But what is important is the message of the three angels. These three messages constitute the everlasting gospel that should be proclaimed to every part of the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people before the coming of Jesus. This message, a threefold message, should be proclaimed. The third angel proclaimed a warning against the worshipping of the beast. Also, worshipping the image of the beast. It also warns the inhabitants of the earth against receiving the mark of the beast. Again, we do not want to study in this hour about the beast, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast. I believe that this is well known among Adventist circles. But uh, the point which I wish to emphasize is that this message, warning against the beast and his image, and the mark of the beast ought to be given with a loud voice. And the people that should proclaim this message in a loud voice committed a mistake. And I want to read this from the Spirit of Prophecy from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 60. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 60. The third angel's message is to be given with power. Notice carefully the expression loud voice, in other words, means to be given with power. The power of the proclamation of the first and second messages is to be intensified in the third. In the Revelation, John says of the heavenly messenger who unites with the third angel, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. Revelation 18, 1 and 2. We are in danger of giving the third angel's message in so indefinite a manner that it does not impress the people. So many other interests are brought in that the very message which should be proclaimed with power becomes tame and voiceless. Here the spirit of prophecy introduces another angel. And this other angel is mentioned in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Let us turn our Bibles to Revelation 18, verse 1. And we read, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. After these things, after which things? Where should we join Revelation chapter 18 verse 1? In Revelation 17, we have a description of spiritual Babylon and the doom of spiritual Babylon. In chapter 16 of Revelation, 
we find the description of the outpouring of the seven last plagues, the wrath of God. In chapter 15, the first verse speaks about the preparation for the outpouring of the seven plagues. And in verse 2, a description of the saints, the overcomers of the beast, his image, and the mark of his mark and the number of his name, overcomers standing on, on the sea of glass. And in continuation speaks about the preparation of these angels to pour out the seven last plagues. So we cannot join Revelation 18 to here. What about to chapter 14, verse 20? In verse 20 of Revelation 14, we read about the wine press of the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is poured out in the time of the seven last plagues. So the angel of Revelation 18 could not come after this event. And if we read Revelation 14, 14, there we read about an angel coming out of the temple and he cried to him, that was sitting on the cloud, that is Jesus coming, he described in verse 14, thrust in your sickle and reap. So verse 14 speaks about the Son of Man coming on the cloud. We could not join Revelation 18 with verse 14. The only place where we can connect Revelation 18 verse 1 is after verse 13 of Revelation chapter 14 and from verse 9 from Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 to 13 we read about the message of the three angels or better, the message of the third angel. And the angel of Revelation 18 is uniting with the third angel. And this is evident from the reading that we had in volume 6, page 60, where it says, John says of the heavenly messenger who unites with the third angel. And now he quotes here the Bible verses from Revelation 18, verses 1, and the first part of verse 2. Therefore, we have three angels with distinct messages. In Revelation 14, verses 6 to 13. But this angel of Revelation 18 does not have a new message. He joins his voice with the third angel to give power to the message of the third angel and also stresses strong emphasis on the message of the second angel according to Revelation chapter 18 verse 2, which we will consider a little bit later. Why was it necessary the coming of this other angel? We have read here, and let us read again on that same page, volume 6, page 60. 
so many other interests are brought in that the very message which should be proclaimed with power becomes tame and voiceless. Notice the angel should proclaim his message with a loud voice. But the people represented by this angel committed a mistake in their hands. The message became tame and voiceless. And the reason is given here why the message became tame and voiceless. We read in continuation, at our camp meetings, a mistake has been made. The Sabbath question has been touched upon, but has not been presented as the great test for this time. While the churches profess to believe in Christ, they are violating the law which Christ himself proclaimed from Sinai. The Lord bids us, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Isaiah 58, 1. The trumpet is to give a certain sound. When you have a congregation before you for only two weeks, do not defer the presentation of the Sabbath question until everything else is presented, supposing that you thus pave the way for it. Lift up the standard, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. Make this the important theme. Then, by your strong argument, make it of still greater force. Dwell on the revelation. Read, explain, and enforce its teaching. The essence of the third angel's message is the Sabbath which should be proclaimed with a loud voice. And the Spirit of Prophecy says that in the camp meetings, a mistake has been made. And what was that mistake? The Sabbath was touched slightly, but it was not presented to the people as the great test for this time and the spirit of prophecy counsels those who have camp meetings evangelistic meetings that when they have a congregation where they should preach the truth they should not leave the question of the Sabbath for the last but they should present this message with boldness. They should present with power, with a loud voice. Now this condition was devised by the enemy of souls. This condition of the message becoming tame and voiceless. In the book Evangelism, on page 230, we read this. Satan has devised a state of things whereby the proclamation of the third angel's message shall be bound about. We must beware of his plans and methods. There must be no toning down of the truth. No muffling of the message for this time. The third angel's message must be strengthened and confirmed. The 18th chapter of Revelation reveals the importance of presenting the truth in no measured terms, but with boldness and power. There has been too much beating about the bush in the proclamation of the third angel's message. The message has not been given as clearly and distinctly as it should have been. The spirit of prophecy here 
makes it clear that Satan devised a plan that the message of the third angel should not be given in a loud voice, should not be given with power. But the Spirit of Prophet says the third angel's message must be strengthened and confirmed. And then we read the 18th chapter of Revelation reveals the importance of presenting the truth with boldness and power. And what is there in the 18th of Revelation? Yes, there is that other angel. So this condition of the message becoming tame and voiceless demanded or required the coming of that other angel. And in Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, pages 118 and 119, we read the following. As foretold in the 18th of Revelation, the third angel's message is to be proclaimed with great power by those who give the final warning against the beast and his image. Notice carefully that the third angel's message will be given, will be proclaimed with great power. By whom? By those that will give the final warning against the beast and his image. And then the spirit of prophecy quotes here, Revelation 18 verses 1 to 6. And then the spirit of prophecy continues. This is the message given by God to be sounded forth in the loud cry of the third angel. It is a solemn and terrible truth that many who have been zealous in proclaiming the third angel's message are now becoming listless and indifferent. The line of demarcation between worldlings and many professed Christians is almost indistinguishable. Many who once were earnest Adventists are conforming to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. Instead of leading the world to render obedience to God's law, the church is uniting more and more closely with the world in transgression. Daily, the church is becoming converted to the world. How many professing Christians are slaves of mammon? Their indulgence of appetite, their extravagant expenditure of money for selfish gratification greatly dishonors God. These conditions among those who once were zealous in proclaiming the third angel's message was evident. And now they were becoming listless and indifferent. And the line of demarcation between them and the worldlings could not be distinguished. Instead of bringing the world, the worldly people, to be converted to the truth, the church was being converted to the world more and more were uniting with the world in transgression. And the Spirit of Prophet says, daily the church is becoming converted to the world. This, condi this condition demanded the coming of that other angel. Another statement I read from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, 217. And the servant of the Lord says, 
I am filled with sadness when I think of our condition as a people. The Lord has not closed heaven to us, but our own course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. Pride, covetousness, and love of the world have lived in the heart without fear of banishment or condemnation. Grievous sins and presumptuous sins have dwelt among us, and yet the general opinion is that the church is flourishing and that peace and spiritual prosperity are in all her borders. The church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power, doubt, and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. Satan would have it thus. Ministers who preach self instead of Christ would have it thus. The testimonies are unread and unappreciated. God has spoken to you. Light has been shining from His Word and from the testimonies, and both have been slighted and disregarded. The result is apparent in the lack of purity and devotion and earnest faith among us. In this testimony that we just read, volume 5, 217, the spirit of prophecy clearly states that the continual backsliding has separated the people from God. And yet, the general opinion was that the church is in prosperity. The church is flourishing. Peace and spiritual prosperity are in all her borders. But the spirit of prophecy states clearly that the church turned back to Christ and is retreating to an opposite direction, retreating towards Egypt. Instead of marching to Canaan, retreating toward Egypt. These conditions demanded the coming of the angel, namely, pride, covetousness, love of the world, the church becoming converted to the world daily, the church turning her back to Christ, her leader, retreating to Egypt, and as we have read before, in their hands, the message became tame and voiceless. Hence, the coming of that other angel. So we are clear now about the reason why that angel had to come. And now we shall consider about the time of the coming of that angel. I read from Review and Herald, November 22, 1892, quoted also in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 363. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. This paragraph here deserves deep consideration and understanding. 
the spirit of prophecy says, the time of test is just upon us. God's people had a great test. And what was the great test that we have read in volume 6, page 61? The Sabbath question was the great test. And the Spirit of Prophecy says, the time of test is just upon us. Because the loud cry of the third angel had already commenced. In what message? In the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This message, Christ our righteousness, the Advent people inherited from Protestantism. Christ our righteousness was proclaimed already in the time of Martin Luther. But at that time, the message Christ our righteousness was proclaimed without works. Just believe and you don't need to do anything. However, when this message was proclaimed in 1888 in the General Conference session at Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Spirit of Prophecy says in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 91 and 92, that that message, Christ our Righteousness, is revealed in the observance of all the commandments of God. So when that message, Christ our righteousness, was presented to the church, that was the beginning of the light of the angel that shall fill the whole earth with his glory. But how was that message received at that time? We read in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 79 and 80. Some have been cultivating hatred against the man whom God has commissioned to bear a special message to the world. They began this satanic work at Minneapolis. Afterward, when they saw and felt the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, testifying that the message was of God, they hated it the more because it was a testimony against them. They would not humble their heart to repent, to give God the glory and vindicate the right. They went on in their own spirit, filled with envy, jealousy and evil surmisings as did the Jews. They opened their hearts to the enemy of God and men. Yet these men have been holding positions of trust and have been molding the work after their own similitude as far as they possibly could. When the message Christ our righteousness was presented to the church by two young ministers, Wagner and Jones, those men that were holding positions of trust, they not only hated, but they rose up against that message. And the Spirit of Prophecy says that they began this satanic work in Minneapolis. And these men occupied positions of trust. And they were molding the work after their own similitude as far as they possibly could. Another statement 
from the same books, Testament to Ministers. I read now on page 91. Yet many have listened to the truth spoken in demonstration of the Spirit, and they have not only refused to accept the message, but they have hated the light. These men are parties to the ruin of souls. They have interposed themselves between the heaven-sent light and the people. They have trampled upon the word of God and are doing this spite to His Holy Spirit. Here, the spirit of prophecy makes it clear that these men holding positions of trust that refused to accept the message, Christ our righteousness, they were parties to the ruin of souls and they have interposed themselves between the heavens and light and the people. The spirit of prophecy gave a warning to those that would interpose between the heavens and light and the people. And I read in the testimony, Gospel Workers, page 304. Gospel Workers, 304. The rebuke of the Lord will rest upon those who would bar the way. That clear light shall not come to the people. A great work is to be done, and God sees that our leading men have need of more light, that they may unite with the messengers whom he sends to accomplish the work that he designs shall be done. The Lord has raised up messengers and endued them with his spirit, and has said, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. Let no one run the risk of interposing between the people and the message of heaven. This message will go to the people, and if there were no voice among men to give it, the very stones would cry out. The message will go to the people, and no one should run the risk of interposing between the heaven sent light and the people. But what was again this message? Christ our righteousness. It was nothing more and nothing less than the counsel to the Laodicean church. In the counsel to the Laodicean church we find that the heavenly merchant offers to the church gold tried in the fire, white raiment, and eye silver. White raiment represents the righteousness of Christ. And therefore, the message to Laodicea was given to the church in 1888. How was the message to Laodicea treated when it was given to the church? In early writings, page 270, I read this. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. When the message to Laodicea or counsel to Laodicea was given to the church, it was not half heeded, if not entirely disregarded. And who despised that message? 
according to what we have read, men that were holding positions of trust, they stood up against the message. But the destiny of the church hangs on this. As we have read, the solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. The destiny of the church was depending on this point, whether the church would accept the council or not. Again in early writings, this time on page 107, as I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are called informal like the nominal churches from which they but a short time since separated. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. They are neither cold nor hot but lukewarm. And unless they heed the counsel of the faithful and true witness and zealously repent and obtain gold tried in the fire, white raiment, and I self, he will spew them out of his mouth. The destiny of the church hangs on this point. Whether the church will accept the counsel of the faithful and true witness to buy white raiment, also gold and I self. Unless the church will obtain these goods, they will be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. This is why the angel of Revelation 18 had come and the message Christ, our righteousness, was the beginning of the light of that angel. In Review and Herald, August 13, 1889, we read this. God has raised up men to meet the necessity of this time, who will cry aloud and spare not, who will lift up their voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Their work is not only to proclaim the law, but to preach the truth for this time, the Lord, our righteousness. This message had to go to the people. This message to Laodicea, or counsel to Laodicea, has a purpose. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 186, we read that the message to Laodicea is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. The angel of Revelation 18 came to do a work in behalf of the church. And the message, Christ our righteousness, or the message to Laodicea, is designed to arouse the people of God, to discover to them their backslidings lead them to zealous repentance so that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted to give the message in a loud voice or loud cry. This 
is the first work of the angel. Remember that the general conference session in 1888 was held in November, the month of November 1888. One year later, to the very time, November 1889, this is what the servant of the Lord uh, recorded in her writings. Review and Herald, November 5, 1889. The question of most vital importance for this time is, who is on the Lord's side? Who will unite with the angel in giving the message of truth to the world? Who will receive the light that is to fill the whole earth with its glory? Important questions. The first question, who is on the Lord's side? Second question, who will unite with the angel? And the third question, who will receive the light that is to fill the whole earth with its glory? By this statement, we understand that the, end, the work of the angel had already begun. And an appeal was made, who is to unite with the angel and receive the light of this angel that shall fill the whole earth with the glory of the Lord. A few years later, the following testimony was written in 1896 and this is recorded in Selected Messages Book 2 page 114 all who are laborers together with God will contend most earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints they will not be turned from the present message which is already lightening the earth with its glory. In 1896, the servant of the Lord said that the message is already lightening the earth with its glory. Another statement which was written previously in 1890 and which is recorded in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 426. It says, Mystic Babylon has not been sparing in the blood of the saints, and shall we not be wide awake to catch the beams of light which have been shining from the light of the angel who is to brighten the earth with his glory? From this testimony we also understand that the light of the angel have, has been already shining. And we accept these statements that the angel began his work in the church try to awaken the church so that the church may accept the message Christ our righteousness although many did not accept the message Christ our righteousness there were always some who did accept In Review and Herald, July 23, 1889, this is what the servant of the Lord said. Review and Herald, July 23, 1889. We thank the Lord with all the heart that we have 
precious light to present before the people. And we rejoice that we have a message for this time, which is present truth. The tidings that Christ is our righteousness has brought relief to many, many souls. And God says to his people, go forward. The message to the Laodicean church is applicable to our condition. How plainly is pictured the position of those who think they have all the truth, who take pride in their knowledge of the word of God, while its sanctifying power has not been felt in their lives. The fervor of the love of God is wanting in their hearts, but it is this very fervor of love that makes God's people the light of the world. In every meeting, since the general conference, souls have eagerly accepted the precious message of the righteousness of Christ. We thank God that there are souls who realize that they are in need of something which they do not possess, gold of faith and love, white raiment of Christ's righteousness, eye salve of spiritual discernment. If you possess these precious gifts, the temple of the human soul will not be like a desecrated shrine. Brethren and sisters, I call upon you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to work where God works. Now is the day of gracious opportunity and privilege. This was just about over half a year after the message was presented at the conference in Minneapolis. We find in this description that the message for this time had different titles. Present Truth, Message to Laodicea, Christ Our Righteousness. They were all combined in one council of the faithful and true witness. And the Spirit of Prophecy says that since the general conference session, there were souls that were eagerly accepting the message, Christ our righteousness, because they realized that they were lacking something. And then the appeal, the appeal of the Spirit of Prophecy is... Brethren and sisters, I call upon you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to work where God works. Now is the day of gracious opportunity and privilege. We know that God's messengers were sent to bring this message to the people. But who were these messengers? A statement that we find in Volume 3, Testimonies for the Church, page 259, reads, There can be no deception here. This message must be born to a lukewarm church by God's servants. It must arouse his people from their security and dangerous deception in regard to their real standing before God. This message, Christ our righteousness, must be brought to a lukewarm church by God's servants. Who are these God's servants? Are they the leaders of the church? You remember what we have read in Gospel Workers? God sees that our leading men have need of more light that they may unite with the messengers whom he sends 
to accomplish the work that he designs shall be done. Gospel Workers 304. The leading men needed more light to unite with the messengers. So these God's servants were not the leaders of the church. But they needed more light to unite with these messengers. And these messengers, they had to deliver the message to a lukewarm church. When the people of God receives the message to Laodicea, the result is what we have read in early writings, page 270. Let us read again. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. Those who accept the message, those who unite with the angel, and those who accept the light of this angel, they will repent will repent of their evil deeds, of their lukewarmness. And as they repent, they will receive the message, obey it, and they will be purified. When God's children, God's people, will be a purified church and the angel will have finished his work in behalf of God's people, then the angel will have another work to perform. And this other work is recorded in the spirit of prophecy in the book the Great Controversy, Great Controversy, page 604. But God still has a people in Babylon. And before the visitation of His judgments, these faithful ones must be called out that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence, the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory, and crying mightily with a loud voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. We find that the angel of Revelation 18 does not only say Babylon is fallen, like the second angel, but he cries mightily with a strong voice announcing the sins of Babylon. Babylon is fallen. But this time it says Babylon the great is fallen. Now what is the meaning Babylon the great is fallen? The commentary of the Spirit of Prophecy Revelation 18 1 2 and 4 is this. This scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14 verse 8 is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. In 1844, the second angel's message was given. Babylon is fallen. But the fall of Babylon was not complete. And this is why the angel did not cry with a loud voice. After that time, many Corruption have been entering in the churches that constitute Babylon. 
And now, the, in the time when this angel will proclaim mightily with a strong voice the fall of Babylon, the call is also given to God's people in Babylon. Come out of her, my people. And as we have read on page 604, who is that going to call out God's people from Babylon? Let me read again. But God still has a people in Babylon. And before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out, that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence, the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of of Babylon. Did you notice that the angel of Revelation 18 is symbolizing one movement? It says the movement symbolized by the angel. This movement symbolized by the angel will extend the invitation to God's people in Babylon. And this angel is not only a movement. In Review and Herald, August 18, 1885, I read the following. The third angel's message must go over the land and awaken the people and call their attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Another angel unites his voice with the third angel, and the earth is lightened with its glory. The light increases, and it shines out to all the nations of the earth. It is to go forth as a light that burneth, it will be attended with great power until its golden beams have fallen upon every tongue, every people, and every nation upon the face of the whole earth. Let me ask you, what are you doing to prepare for this work? Are you binding for eternity? You must remember that this angel represents the people that have this message to give to the world. Are you among that people? Do you really believe that this work in which we are engaged is truly the third angel's message? If so, then you understand that we have a mighty work to do and that we ought to be about it. Review and Herald, August 18, 1885. In this statement, it shows clearly that another angel joins the third to proclaim the third angel's message with power and enlighten the earth with the glory of the Lord. And then the spirit of prophecy says, you must remember that this angel represents the people that have this message to give to the world. Yes, the angel of Revelation 18 represents a movement and represents also a people. And the question of the servant of the Lord is, are you among these people? We should ask ourselves, are we among that people that represent that angel, that movement 
that will give the final warning to the world? Coming back to great controversy, we, we read about the final warning on page 604. Let's read again, and we read until the end of the paragraph. Hence, the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory, and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. In connection with his message, the call is heard. Come out of her, my people. These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Who is going to give the final warning to the earth? The movement of the angel of Revelation 18, represented by or symbolized by that angel. And remember that that movement is also a people they are going to give the final warning. And what constitutes the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth? We read here, Babylon, the great, is fallen. Is fallen. This is one point. The second point, come out of her, my people. And we read, these announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute a final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. In other words, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God, because that is the essence of the third angel's message. These constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. And who is giving this warning? Is given by this movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven. Now let me read another statement, the same book, Great Controversy, page 608, Great Controversy 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. Let us think about this statement we just read. A large class of those who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position, join the ranks of the opposition. And this takes place as the storm approaches, before the storm is present. This is the first step. The second step, they unite with the world more and more, partake of its spirit, and they come to view matters in nearly the same light. This is the second step. And when the final test comes, they are already prepared 
to choose the easy popular side. And then these men of talent of this large class, they are men of pleasing address. They once rejoiced in the truth, but now they employ their power to deceive and mislead souls. And notice carefully, they become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. What do you understand from this expression, former brethren? To me, it indicates that there was a separation. Not everybody passed to the ranks of the opposition, only a large class, but there were some that remained faithful. And when this separation occurred, these faithful became known as the former brethren of the large class. And the large class become the most bitterest enemies of their former brethren. Now let us read in continuation, because here we have two classes of people, a large class and their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. In this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servants will be tried. Who are the Lord's servants mentioned here? Are the large class or their former brethren? Obviously, the former brethren of the large class who did not join the ranks of the opposition. They are the Lord's servants. In this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servants will be tried. They have faithfully given the warning looking to God and to His Word alone. Who is going to give the final warning? In this statement, former brethren of the large class will give the final warning. But we have read that the movement symbolized by the angel of Revelation 18 will give the final warning. So who are these former brethren, who are this uh, people and who is this movement by the work that they perform we can identify them. There was a separation among those who professed faith in the third angel's message, but were not sanctified by obedience to the truth. And one class known as the former brethren of that large class, they will give faithfully the warning. And the warning is given by the movement of the angel of Revelation 18. In order that we may know for sure that the former brethren of the large class which represent a movement, represent the movement of the angel of Revelation 18, will give the final warning and that the work of God will advance under the leadership of that other angel is evident from this statement which we are going to read. Testimonies to Ministers, page 300. Testimonies to Ministers 300. Unless those who can help in such place 
are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made. And now notice this sentence. To dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. The work of God will advance under the leadership of this angel of Revelation 18. And the angel of Revelation 18 joined the third angel. The third angel had joined the second. The second angel joined the first. So all four angels joined together. Volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, page 383 says, The message loses none of its force in the angel's onward flight, for John sees it increasing in strength and power until the whole earth is lightened with its glory. The angel flies onward and forward all four angels in volume 6 page 17 I read this the three angels of Revelation 14 are represented as flying in the midst of heaven symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first second and third angels messages all are linked together the messages are linked together the angels fly forward and onward. But where is the people that should represent that angel going? You remember we have read volume 5, page 217. The church turned back, turned her back to Christ, the leader, and is retreating towards Egypt. Remember, the angel is flying towards Canaan, and the church is retreating toward Egypt. What angel does that church represent? Remember, all four angels fly onward, forward, in this direction, but the church goes backward to opposite direction. What angel does that church represent? No church at all. Who represents all these angels? Are those that united with the angels and they are all linked together. In the Review and Herald, December 23, 1890, this is what the Spirit of Prophecy gives us as a warning. There is to be, in the church, is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door of the heart by confession and repentance. In the manifestation of that power which lightens the earth with the glory of God, they will see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous, something which will arouse their fears, and they will brace themselves to resist it. Because the Lord does not work according to their ideas and expectations, they will oppose the work. Why? 
We have been in the work so, so many years. They say, should we know the Spirit of God when we have been in the work so many years? Because they did not respond to the warnings, the entreaties of the messages of God, but persistently said, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And in Testimonies to Ministers, page 468 and 469, I read, I know that a work must be done for the people or many will not be prepared to receive the light of the angel sent down from heaven to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Many will refuse to accept the message. They refuse to unite with the angel. And they will say, how come that we will not recognize the message? We have been in the work for so many years. And they brace themselves to resist the message. And they see something dangerous in this message that will lighten the whole earth with the glory of God. The angel of Revelation 18, we are told in the Bible that they will, he will enlighten the whole earth with the glory of God. And what is that glory? Many people have different ideas. One day someone told me that when the Adventists will have churches and members in every city of the world, the earth will be enlightened with the glory of God. Interesting that in 1888, among the Adventists, they did not have yet 30,000 people. And if they have accepted the message in a short time, the earth will be enlightened with the glory of God. What is the glory that will lighten the earth? Some may think that when the uh, church will have institutions such as publishing houses, hospitals, schools, broadcasting programs, church building, health food stores and factories, etc. These constitute a great light. However, these, although important, this is not the glory that will fill the whole earth. Neither a great number of membership is a proof that they are enlightening the earth with the glory of God. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 143, we read, If numbers were an evidence of success, Satan might claim the preeminence, for in this world his followers are largely in the majority. Testimonies to Ministers, page 277, Not in numbers, but in the perfect trust and unity with Christ, one can chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight. Numbers is not an evidence of success. Many people ask me, how can you, a few people, 
compared with other churches, take the message and the warning to all the world. Only a handful of people, and in reality, compared with many other churches, the Seventh-day Adventist reform movement is still a little flock. We are few in number, true. But my question is, when Gideon was called to go out and face the enemy, 32,000 went out with him, and the Lord said, no, too many people. Those that are afraid, those have family problem may go back home. 22,000 returned to their homes and remained there only 10,000. And the Lord said, still too many. Take them to the waters and I will prove them. And how many were approved from those 10,000? Only 300 men. 31,700 were left out. And God gave victory to his people through these 300. Commenting about that experience, the servant of the Lord says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 550, success does not depend upon numbers. God can deliver by few as well as by many. He is honored not so much by the great numbers as by the character of those who serve him. God can finish his work with few or with many. God does not depend on quantity, but he expects and he is honored by those who serve him and those who have a character fit for heaven. But what is it the glory that shall fill the whole earth. We remember that the beginning of the light of the angel was the message, Christ our righteousness. And this will be also the culmination. This will be the light that will fill the whole earth. In Review and Herald, November 22 and 29, 1892, I read this. The revelation of Christ by the Holy Spirit brought to them, to the disciples, a realizing sense of His power and majesty, and they stretched forth their hands unto Him by faith, saying, I believe. Thus it was in the time of the early rain, but the latter rain will be more abundant. The Savior of men will be glorified, and the earth will be lightened with the bright shining of the beams of His righteousness. And what is the righteousness of Christ? which is the light that will lighten the whole earth, is his unblemished character. When the character of Jesus Christ is reproduced in us, and the world will see Jesus in us, that will be the light that will enlighten the whole earth. In Christ Object Lessons, page 418, it says, 
the whole earth wrapped as it is in darkness of sin and sorrow and pain is to be lightened with the knowledge of God's love. And on page 419, Christ has made every provision that his church shall be a transformed body, illumined with the light of the world, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. He desires that we shall reveal his own joy in our lives. And on page 420, Christ Object Lessons, the beauty and fragrance of the character of Christ revealed in the life testifies that God has indeed sent his Son into the world to be its Savior. Only those that bear the character of Christ will be able to give the final warning to the world. And they will enlighten the whole earth with the glory of God, Christ our righteousness. And Christ our righteousness means that our glory, our goodness, our reputation, all this should be cast down to the dust. And Christ and his character should be seen in us. When the people look at us, they should see Christ in us. And when the world will see Jesus in us, they will see the good works. They will glorify our Heavenly Father. The Bible gives us a wonderful promise. And this promise will be fulfilled. In Numbers chapter 14 verse 21, we read, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And another statement from the Bible, in the book of Habakkuk, Chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. This is a promise and an assurance that the earth will be enlightened with the glory of God. And that glory is the character of Jesus reproduced by his people. His people that represent that other angel. And that other angel is preparing his people to give the message with the greatest power, with the power of the Holy Spirit that will be poured out in the time of the latter rain that the angel of Revelation 18 had already come and is in, his work is in progress. The greatest proof of that is your presence here. To me that is the greatest proof. And let us answer that question asked by the servant of the Lord, are you among that people? May the Lord help us that we may be among those that will enlighten the world with the glory of God. This is my desire in Jesus' name. Amen.